Hey, what's up everyone? Your buddy Matt here. So if you remember in one of my last videos, I told you that we'd start working on this 1969 Alice Chalmers forklift. And today we're going to make do on that promise. But before we get into any actual mechanics, I want to create a bit of a benchmark and see exactly where this thing stands as is. How well does it start? How does it work? I mean, I told you that the engine does run and then it goes forwards and backwards. The hydraulic system does work, although it does have some problems. The mass kind of stalls out at a three quarter height. Is it just because it's missing fluid? It does have a pretty significant leak, but it could be something more serious. In terms of the electrical system, I haven't really gone through any of that. The braking system we know doesn't work at all. So today what we're going to do is we're going to create that benchmark. We're going to start it up. We're going to test all the systems and we're going to see exactly how it runs now. And then we're probably going to tackle the first thing that I'd like to do, which is the fuel system. So if that sounds good, I invite you to stick around. You're going to enjoy this video. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start it up. It hasn't started in probably about a month and my garage is probably about 15 degrees Celsius right now. So we're going to give it a cold start and we'll see how much time it takes to crank over and how easily it starts. So it smells like gas, but uh, that's it. So I just put the choke on manually and I remembered that's how I start it kind of from down here. Let's see. We hear the fuel pump kick on, no gas. We're in neutral. Try giving it some gas. <laughs> Doesn't even want to start. All right, so we'll have to resort to putting a little bit of starter fluid in it. In the summertime, when it's nice and toasty, it did start. But uh, like I said, in the winter, it has a bit of hard time starting. And uh, even though we're not in winter conditions because we're inside a heated garage, we'll have to give it a little bit of starter fluid. Let's see if it goes. Get the battery charger on it and we'll reassess our strategy. Got the booster pack on it. Let's see if a little bit faster cranking speed helps. Okay. All right, so that did not go as well as I hoped. Um, I had to use ether. I ended up draining a battery. I had to put my booster pack on it and I couldn't take my hand or foot off the gas pedal. It would just stall out. It didn't want to hold its idle. I know that the engine is not that warm right now, but still that definitely didn't run as smoothly as I was hoping it would run. So I'm gonna have to put off the benchmark test a little bit because if I can't get this thing running properly, well, I won't be able to do all the other tests that I want to do. So we'll still check compression and spark plugs, but then we're going to dive right into that fuel system. Take the carb apart, check out the fuel lines, the fuel pump, what that tank looks like. So yeah, we're going to have to start getting our hands dirty ASAP.
All right, so what do we got here? AC Delco R44 XL. Not too sure if that's the right plug or not, but uh, it's looking pretty good. Nice little chocolatey brown color. That's plug number, I don't know, one or four. Who knows? We'll call it plug number one. Plug. Looking good. But uh, same type of plug, a little bit oily, a little bit more carbon on that one, but uh, still looking okay. So that's that's pretty good news. Plugs are looking decent. Let's get a compression tester and uh, see how much compression it has. All right, we're gonna go ahead and uh, do a compression test on the engine. Um, I'm using a gauge that I just recently calibrated. If you guys are interested, I put up a video on how I did that. You guys can go check it out. We're starting with cylinder number one. I'm gonna determine that number one is the one closest to the fan. Uh, the engine is basically installed backwards on this, uh, on this forklift, uh, like most forklifts, in fact. So we're gonna call the one closest to the fan number one. So we're checking cylinder number one's compression. All right, we got about 120. 120 on cylinder number one. Checking cylinder number two. Uh, the main thing I wanna have is not more than 10% difference. Cylinder number two. Yep, 120. So I would assume that 120 is kind of low, although I'm not all that sure for an engine of this era. Um, but like I said, as long as I don't have more than 10% difference, I'll be happy. We're now on cylinder number three. I should mention that I uh, disconnected the um, ignition coil and the fuel pump. All right, between 120 and 125, Call it 122. Last but not least, we're installing into cylinder number four, and if we're lucky, we'll be around 120 as well. A little, a little just a hair over 120, also. So we have right across the board about 120. Uh, PSI, which is uh, perfect because I don't have a large difference between all the cylinders and that's exactly what I wanted. So now I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit of oil in each cylinder and redo my compression test. Uh, the theory is that the oil is going to take up any space that there would be in terms of wear uh, in the piston rings. Uh, it will not correct if there's any wear in the valves, but it'll give you a good idea of what the overall wear in terms of the pistons are. So let's go ahead and redo the compression test with oil. Cylinder number one. Step 
Now with oil, we're at 130 PSI on cylinder number one. We've gone up by about 10 PSI, which is not all that much. So this engine might not have all that much wear in it. Cylinder number two. One thirty two. Cylinder number three. We're at one thirty five. I should also mention that this engine is nowhere near uh, operating temperature. So normally you would do a compression test on a warm engine. Uh, this engine is uh, is cold. And cylinder number four. One hundred and thirty PSI with oil. Let's take a couple seconds to talk about the spark plugs. They're AC Delco R forty four XLS plugs. Not too sure if that's what goes in this engine, but that's what was in it. Um, I made this nifty little stand to hold them. That way we can see uh, what they look like comparatively. And I was honestly, I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, when you look at the plugs, there's no evident mechanical damage. It's not as if one of them has any type of, uh, of, of damage. And I sort of suspected that there wouldn't be because the engine did run fairly well, wasn't burning too much oil, so on and so forth. Um, when we look at the first plug over here, a nice chocolatey brown color, uh, not too much carbon. The second one, maybe a little bit more carbon on it, but again, a nice color. The third one, could be considered the worst plug, but by no means is a is an alarming uh, bad plug. Uh, obviously, a little bit more carbon on this one. This one would have the most, but you know, not that bad. And the last one, very similar to the first one, is one of the best ones. Uh, you know, I don't want to see oily plugs. I don't want to see excessive carbon buildup. I don't want to see ash or white, uh, and I definitely don't want to see any mechanical damage. And as far as we're concerned, our plugs seem to pass the test. So that's really great news. Now all we have to ask ourselves is, do we clean them or do we replace them? I'm not sure yet. So I think the last step uh, in our quick little engine condition diagnostic here is checking the engine oil. Um, it's kind of neat, they welded this dipstick extension on. I'm not sure how well you guys can uh, see this. The level is right at the low mark and the oil is a little bit gritty and a lot old. So uh, yeah, this thing is definitely going to enjoy a nice oil change, but uh, because we know that our compression is good, um, I'm pretty confident that there's no issues with this engine mechanically. Let's, uh, let's move on to the fuel system. So here we have the carburetor. We can see this particular one is pretty scuzzy, all kind of covered in grime. Not too sure where that grime came from. I mean, there's obviously some maybe exhaust leaks or oil leaks that, uh, that caused that dirt to, to accumulate over time. But, uh, but that doesn't matter right now because we're gonna take it off and we're gonna clean it. One thing I'd like to mention is the choke lever. This bad boy right over here is completely seized. So every time I'd want to start it, I'd have to get off, use my finger to, to activate it, start it, and then jump off and try to get the choke off. And I'm sure that didn't help me start it. Um, it's a rigid fuel line that's connected over here to the back of the carb. And the air intake section is this duct taped up cardboard piece of plumbing that hooks up to a piece of flexible pipe and then comes up to this makeshift external air filter. The original air filter from what I can see in the diagrams would have had a rubber pipe and the air filter would have been right about here. So I'm not too sure what we're going to do about that yet but one thing's for sure is we're going to take this off to get a better look at that carb. Okay, so someone very graciously tacked on this, uh, this linkage assembly. So removal, I'll try to get this little ball, this little ball jointy part off. But uh, yeah, 
It's always fun when someone does a, a temporary fix that ends up screwing you over in the long run. So like I mentioned before, there's a rigid fitting on the carb and then there's a rubber hose that's attached to a bunch of miscellaneous fittings and then back to the, I guess, the original steel line. So we'll just go ahead and cut this rubber hose because I don't want to disturb the, uh, the carb fitting just yet. I'll do that when I have the carb actually in hand. Okay, so here's an interesting finding indeed. Um, it looks like, and I'm not sure, it's kind of hard to get in there, but see there's a, a nut or a bolt over here. It's so dirty I can't even really tell. Um, and then on the other side, it looks like I got a piece of threaded, it's like as if you have a stud all the way through. So I'm not sure how that hooks on, but we might be missing a nut there. So maybe this carb is only held on by this guy. So we'll take this guy off and see if the whole carb comes off. And that might explain a bit of the runnability issues. All right, sure enough, it looks like it's only held on with one bolt. Don't forget that governor linkage, kids. with the world's skinniest cotter pin. Okay, so here's the, uh, the world famous uh, Alice Chalmers carburetor. Uh, it is dirty and uh, you can see that as I suspected it was holding on by just one nut so it has two studs it was holding on by one nut you can see there's a bit of wear you can see a bit of discoloration where it might have been pulling in a bit of air um, now it, i've been manipulating it so the gas is coming out but the bowl did seem to have a bit of a leak or was kind of leaky uh, maybe that gasket as we mentioned before it's got the rigid line i didn't want to risk taking it apart while i was on the machine now i can take it apart properly over here and i'll check and see do i keep a rigid line or do i put maybe a barbed fitting and and more of this rubber hose. Um, if we look inside it, it looks okay. You know, this is this is that linkage, that shoddy weldment repair that I mentioned earlier. Uh, someone just kind of tacked on. I don't know. This whole thing is all kind of sloppy. The governor side's not too bad, but uh, the throttle side has seen better days. The choke seems okay. Again. Dirty, kind of grimy, but uh, you know, as to be expected, this is going to be disassembled and cleaned out and uh, should give us much better performance from there on out. Now normally I would, uh, I would take this thing apart first and then have it soak in Varsol, but uh, because it's so grimy and I've never taken one of these apart before, I'd like it to be a little cleaner. So I'm just going to put a bit of gasoline in this, uh, in this container and have it soak probably overnight, and uh, then I'll be able to clean it off, do a superficial cleaning, and then we'll take it apart. So while that carburetor is soaking, let's take a little look at what, what comprises this fuel system. So originally, this is a mechanical fuel pump that was on this thing, or that's still on it, and there's a the little glass bowl, um, kind of your little sediment filter, 
and it's not hooked up. So it's still physically in place, but for whatever reason, they would have condemned that and replaced it by this electric fuel pump over here. So I can see a date on this. I guess this is a check valve. This is 2015. So maybe in 2015, that mechanical pump failed or before, and this is just a replacement that they put on. But regardless, this pump here is hooked up electrically uh, to the ignition switch. As soon as you put the key to the on position uh, with or without the motor running, it sends power to this pump uh, and it should energize or um, send, start sending fuel up until the bowl is full, at which point, you know, the needle valve would close and it would stop, uh, it would stop sending fuel. So this fuel pump pulls in fuel from this, I guess, pickup line over here. And there's a fuel filter right down here that's there, a gas filter. And before that, we have the gas tank that's hard to, uh, hard to see. You can take it off from underneath. You can see there the piece with the wire uh, on the left of the cap is the uh, sending, uh, or no, the, uh, the fuel level uh, connection and the fitting where the gas line is hooked up. Well, we can't see it from here, but uh, that's it. It's hooked up to the tank. So I'm not sure if there's a screen in the tank or what. Back up on top, when, uh, when the fuel comes up here, goes through the filter, goes through the check valve, and then goes through the fuel pump, goes off back, I guess, to what would be the original rigid line that goes around the engine. Into this side where the carb is supposed to be. And then we have this sort of uh, mishmash of different fittings that I'm not too sure, you know, would have been put on. Uh, and then like we saw when we removed the carb, the flexible line goes back to another rigid that's on the carburetor. What I want to do is I want to check the fuel system in its entirety. So I'll put the ignition key on. I want to see that pump energize. I haven't changed the filter. I know there's gas in it, but I want to see if everything works. I also want to check and see if that check valve works. And we'll be testing over here how much flow is coming out of the open end of that gas line. All right, let's check that gasoline. Pump is priming and it immediately starts shooting out gas. Okay, so as we've seen uh, with no restriction, uh, it does, the pump does seem to have good flow. Uh, although this video might make it seem like I just tried starting it, uh, we're actually about three or four days later. So this fuel pump has not been energized for the past, you know, I'd say four days. That means that that check valve most probably does its job because uh, as soon as I put the key on, it did start squirting out gas. So I would say that this system does have potential We'll just go ahead and take that filter off and um, I'd like to take a look in the tank and see if uh, see how clean it is. Uh, but that filter might give us a good idea. So let's 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 jump on that right away. So I, uh, I sawed this fuel filter in half. This is the, uh, this is the suction side. This is the outlet side. So uh, all the crap in theory should be in this end. And it is. I mean, it's not too bad. It's really not that bad. I mean, there's a little bit of fine particle. Uh, when we look at the actual filter, it's kind of stuck in the end. That's it because it's, it's sealed in the end. But that's it. There's nothing... There's nothing major. There's no, there's no major particles of rust. So I get the feeling that that gas tank, the inside of the gas tank is probably in, in, in relatively good condition, but the outside concerns me. So when I say that the outside concerns me, if you look at the, uh, 
the state of this tank. It's an all steel tank from the 60s. And although it doesn't appear to have too much rust, there's a lot of um, dirt and grime that could contain humidity. And all that humidity, well, could rot out this tank. So there is a little bit of rust, and I'm not too sure to what extent there is. So I think it's only held on by two bolts that we can see rather well just over there. And uh, if we drop those two bolts, I could probably get this tank out and at the very least brush it down and give it a shot of primer and some paint. Try to give it another 50 years of service life. So that could not have gone any easier. It was really only held on by two bolts and it was kind of just hanging in the frame. So as soon as those two bolts came off, plopped it down, jacked up the side and took it out. We can see there's a bracket here that would have been used maybe in the past for, I don't know, maybe a fuel filter that mounted on there. Or I'm not sure I'll have to check the parts manual. Like I said before, this is the unit that has the float. This was broken. So, uh, when I was going to disconnect it, I noticed that the wire was broken right off, so I didn't bother. Um, this is the fuel cap over here. <sighs> pretty cool, pretty cool looking fuel cap that kind of just locks in here and then here. It does have a screen on the inside and uh, it's relatively clean. This is, the, this is the line coming out of it and look, another, another union. So this thing would have been chopped up. At least when we put it back together, it can be all one, one solid line and stop having all these patches. Now this is what I was concerned about over here. All this dirt residue that uh, that's kind of caked on, uh, that can hold humidity and then lead to rust. Now luckily, I mean, I'm not sure if all old gas tanks are in this solid a condition or if this was maybe a machine that was kept indoors or I'm not sure, but uh, I don't find that there's a very significant amount of rust on it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna brush it all down, clean it off, and uh, most probably just put a protective coating on it, primer, maybe some paint, and then put it back in. And that way there I know that it won't rot through, at least not while I'm the owner. Uh, the scraping revealed some things that I'm not too happy to see. This uh, super great condition gas tank apparently has seen some repairs in the past. Uh, looks like someone plugged up some holes maybe with some lead. There's a bit like you could see over here. There's also some underneath. Um, minor issues that I can see are Right now, obviously this unit is missing. There's a bolt that's either broken or missing. Looks like it's broken. So it does leak technically from this gasket. A little bit of leaking from here to be expected, but you know, your fuel level is probably never gonna be that high. Then this guy, maybe a little more concerning. This weld over here, looks like there's a bit of a pinhole and it is leaking a bit. Once again, it's up at the top of the tank. So maybe not that big of a deal, easy to fix. These guys, well, they look like they're pretty reliable. So there's a plug on the bottom. What I'll do is now that it's kind of, you know, a little cleaner, I'll, uh, I'll take the plug out and I'll drain the gas and then we'll, we'll inspect the rest of it. So we'll let this tank take a little leak. Um, if you noticed, when I took that drain plug off, nothing came out and I had to kind of poke a little hole in the crusty crust that was at the bottom of it. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how much crap is in the bottom of that tank. This was a clean container, so we'll see also the sediments that are in it. And we'll, uh, we'll go from there.
So while we're waiting for that to drain, I took the liberty of removing the, uh, the screws on here. Required a bit of loose nut, an impact driver, a big screwdriver, and a lot of patience. I didn't break anything. There was already one that was broken, but uh, I got it out. So let's check and see if we can get this unit out. That'll give us a good access point to see the inside of the tank. Okay. okay it's spring loaded. Oh, how the heck does the guy come out? There we go. Like this. Try not to send any of this old gasket in. There we go. Okay. Looking good, looking good. So the uh, the fuel unit, we can test that and see, you know, if it was really just the the broken wire, the problem, and uh, we could probably recuperate that. But this guy's looking really good. Good news. Okay, so more good news. If we take a look at the inside of this tank, we can see that it's uh, it's very very clean. Look at that. There's a bit of a baffle at the back. You can see it just there. But overall, this tank, you know, is probably galvanized steel, and uh, it did its job. So this 1960s metal is, uh, is very, very robust. Now we'll have to just check and see about these patches here. But overall, I'm confident that this is going to be a good tank, and I'm not expecting to see too much sediment in that gasoline. So, uh, so that's good news, good news for us. So I'm not exactly sure what to think about this tank. For 1969, I do consider it to be in relatively good condition. It does hold fuel and it doesn't have any significant leaks. It does, however, have some pretty heavy pitting on this face over here and underneath. Uh, it has been patched in the past with some lead. What I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna try to prevent it from corroding any further. I'll use a brush on oil based um, rust proof paint and then I'll go with a coat of again brush on black uh, rust proofing paint. The reason why I want to brush it on is because I want two nice thick coats in order to give it maximum uh, rust resistance. I did extract and retap the broken uh, bolt that was over here on that uh, fuel gauge unit. I removed some of the caps and once I put the primer on, I'm going to go ahead and probably silicone around here. There was a small pinhole leak, so I'm just going to silicone that. And then I'll put the final black coating, cover it all up, and I think I'll call that a day. So let's get priming.
right, guys, I think this video is getting long enough. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get it started. I'm gonna have to make a part two of this fuel system video. Uh, I just received the carb kit yesterday, so I'll be able to, to rebuild that and get it back on the machine. The gas tank's all done, painted, dried up. We'll be able to reinstall it and we'll be able to do that benchmark test that I'm looking forward to doing to see everything else on the machine, how well it runs. Now, I don't think the next video is gonna be that part two, because a little hint, if you look over here, you see that little red dirt bug mini bike? Well, summer is coming and I wanna get that thing started. So I think the next video is gonna be of getting that dirt bug going, and I wanna do a modification to the sprocket because I'm getting a little bit heavier than the 150 pound weight limit so I'm gonna modify it so I can have enough torque to ride around this summer. So if that sounds good, stay tuned for that next video. Thanks a lot for watching, signing out.